Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in again. I am Katie Batesman, the Content Director at She Can Code, and today we're covering the leaky pipeline between higher education and early careers. Women leave science, technology, engineering and mathematics or STEM fields at much higher rate, rates than men do. This so-called leaky pipeline phenomenon suggests that more and more women are progressively lost at each stage of their STEM career from education through to leadership. So what can be done to tackle this leaky pipeline once and for all? I've got Dr. Andrea Johnson, Chairperson of Women in Technology and Science and VP at Work Human with me today to discuss what support structures need to be in place. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you for joining us. Can, can we kick off with a little bit of background about yourself, please? Yeah, so like, as you said, I'm the Chair of Women in Technology and Science uh, and VP at Work Human. Um, I'm the mama of five rescue doggies and two rescue donkeys, and I'm a long-suffering Evertonian. So that should, that should give you a flavour of the spectrum of my depths and joy here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I haven't heard that one yet. Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, you obviously have a, a passion for animals. Um, did you have a passion for STEM, or was that something that you discovered from an early age or something that you fell into? We hear a lot of ladies fall into it. Uh, I fell into it. I was a mature student, so I went back to, uh, well, I went to university at, at the grand old age of 30. Um, and I remember when I was, I was taking my degree, I got given a really great piece of advice. I wanted to be a um, IT and or maths teacher. And on the open day, I remember the guy saying to me, go and take a general computer science or information systems degree. Don't do your teaching degree. I remember at the time feeling utterly discombobulated that that's kind of what I'd have my heart set on. I was always going to be a teacher, actually a history teacher. Um, but I did take his advice and I, I, over the years, found myself giving others that exact same advice about doing a general degree. And then you have options open to you, obviously, then um, postgraduate options if you want to go and teach or do research or, or anything like that. So I joined the class and I was in a little cohort of mature students, will we call them? Um, and I remember, I didn't know it was called that at the time, but uh, I think for the first 18 months, I just thought someone was going to tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, soft girl, what are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. Um, and it's imposter syndrome at its absolute best. But I, I really did. I found my tribe there. There was other mature students, uh, some girls who had families who were juggling work. And we kind of stuck together and it was phenomenal. And kind of that passion around women and advancing women in STEM kind of came from that very late on, if you like, um, you know, looking to see how difficult it, it can be to access and then actually step into careers in this area. Yeah, yeah, which is something that um, we we hear a lot and something that we're, we're going to cover a bit more in depth today, um, because research suggests, you know, an incredibly high percentage of female STEM graduates, they leave their careers here early on. Why, why do you think this is? I think there's a number of, of reasons on that. I was speaking to the CEO of um, Health Tech Ireland the other day, and she comes from a um, med tech pharma background. And when I was asking her about sort of the, the grads who fall out sort of within that area, it's very much as they come through their training, they're expecting something different when they get onto the bench in a lab. And it's not that. And it's actually really stark and completely different than what they had in the head. And a lot, a lot of them will leave at that stage. So I think it depends if you think about the pipeline as young women advance, as you leave your um, course and, and you think you're armed with all these fabulous things and you're stepping, whether it's into industry or academia, Sometimes the reality of that, Kaylee, is very, very different and it can be actually quite jarring. It was, um, we have a fabulous guy here in Work Human who's one of our architects and, and his daughter is studying at one of the um, fabulous uh, schools here in, in Ireland and she's doing mathematics and he, he's, he's really, and the, she's one of five in the class, women. And she's found that difficult as she's gone through that. Now she's top of the class. She's phenomenal. She is her father's daughter. 
Um, but she's found that sort of the interaction and the social side of that. And it wasn't, I say, until year three that she really sort of found her stride. And, and you think you see that in the experience around that feeling of other and that feeling different uh, it is one of the big pieces in that. And if you can actually get through co your college experience and then go into industry, I think we all think that that will change and it will be different. But actually then, depending on what industry or what environment you step into, it can actually be more stark and more jarring, um, which is... When you're young, it can be utterly discombobulating. So what, what can we do? I think we have to put in some really great structures around that, where it's around networks and kind of that normalization. And, and I spoke to you before about the power of finding my tribe, the three or four, you know, mature students who, who went through that, that experience. I think the power of that cannot be underestimated. I speak about the power of finding your tribe to women returners to work and say, you know, the women that they're on the course with, they will never meet other people who absolutely understand where they are right now because they're sitting next to them and they're thinking and they're feeling exactly the same thing. So, I mean, I think that first step out of sort of whether it's graduate or postgraduate education into industry or other work, Sometimes that can be really, really jarring. And I think that you can absolutely, you need to put some supports around that. I think, I think some of the other pieces then are, that you want to maybe pry apart in that is how you support people on that journey. So how you support them into the first people leadership role or promotion or, or, or into even flexing into other areas. I'm sure, I mean, I've listened to some of your podcasts. You've touched on it before, our careers aren't linear. This isn't like years ago, you join the bank, you join the civil service, you're 30 years in and you're going, that's not what's happening now. You're, you're going like this. I think um, Michelle Obama calls it the swerve, doesn't she? And yes. I, I think that's absolutely great because it's not linear. Like sometimes you will, you'll take a side move or maybe a, a, a little one down to come back up again to get to the places there where you want to be. And I think we need to equip definitely equip our humans in, in sort of that real, that style of thinking about that and taking on those stretch opportunities where they can do that and, and building in supports around that as well. Mm. And, and, you, and you're right, that, that swerve in that career, being able to change careers nowadays is, is a great thing because you're right, you, sometimes you leave uni, you, you don't quite know what you're going to get in the world of work. And actually, you don't know whether or not you're going to like the first job that you get in anyway. And it can be such a shock that at least thankfully nowadays, especially in technology, there are lots of routes for you to, to keep moving around. And you can think, oh, actually, that that one wasn't for me, whether that was um, something to do with the company, the, the job itself, or like you mentioned, perhaps you felt out of place. Um, but thankfully, you know, you can you can move around a little bit. I remember, though, that that baptism of fire when you reach work, it's it's frightening anyway when you're a graduate and you never really match the skills that you learn at uni and bring them into the workplace because you have to you know prepare for whatever that first team and um, how, how they work together. Um, and it's 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 very daunting. And I suppose you know, workplaces try to, to bridge that gap um, as, as much as they can. But, you know, I mean, in terms of um, what we can do, you know, what more can higher education do to prepare female graduates for the world of work? Because it is it is always that worry, isn't it, when when you, you go into the first job and you think, oh, I wasn't prepared for that. I've got the skills, but I wasn't prepared. <laughs> I wish someone would have told me the importance of networks and the importance of, I mean, if someone would have told my younger self, uh, you know, networks are important, I would, have, I would have had this vision of me in a room with a business card in my hand going to, you know, having to talk to strangers and that would have filled me with utter dread, believe it or believe it not. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about making meaningful connection. And making those connections and being intentional about them, because that's how you're going to get this kind of 
um, network of support that you can sort of build around you um, in a really authentic way. Do you know what I mean? Because I, I, yeah. I, I often have people, um, young professionals within the business reaching into me saying, you know, will you be my mentor? And I always take them for a coffee and we have a chat. And the chemistry's got to be there. Like you, you're literally saying, yeah, you know, could I work with them? Could they work with me? If this isn't going to work, actually, there might be someone else who could be way more suited to this. Um, so that authenticity, I think, is really, really important. Mm-hmm. But building those networks and connections means that if you're faced with difficult decisions or problems, you have other folks that you can go and lean into. And it just means you're not alone trying to figure this out. And it's very much like that. Usually there's very few things that's going to, you know, you're going to encounter in the world that someone else hasn't been through. So you're actually really thinking about me maybe ringing you and saying, Kaylee, I've got this thing going on. What do you think? And you say, God, I haven't got a clue. But you know what? I know someone who can do this. And really starting to sort of stretch into that sisterhood. (laughs) if you like, of making those connections and being really authentic with them. I, I, I'm always loath to call that networking because, again, it takes me back to me in my power suit and my red lipstick with my business cards in my hand, filling me with absolute terror, Kaylee, like you don't want to do it. It's not that. It's like that meaningful connection piece. And I think we should really talk about how we can do that, how you can join groups that may be lean-in circles or coffee connections or things like that where it's an easier lift, but all of a sudden then you've maybe got opportunity to do that. And I think that's really, really important. But going back to the point that you said there about, you know, how ill-prepared and how, how maybe people get there, I do something really great here once a year. So we run something, we work with an organization called Teen Turn and they bring in transition years students and they're showcasing the world of work within a STEM, fast moving, fast paced organization. So it's work human. And what I do is I do um, I do an afternoon tea session and I invite a load of our, lots of different women across the business to come in and chat to the, to the girls that we have. And one of the things I ask them, I go around the table as we're eating our scones and I say, what got you into your career and how did you get there? Did you want to be a senior automation quality engineer from day one? Do you know what I mean? Like, did you, <laughs> were you popped out and that's what you wanted? No, it's not. And as you go around the table, there's something really, really interesting. Some people on the maybe the development side, they knew this is what they wanted to do. They, they, they knew they were going to go into engineering science and that was that. Others have fallen into it in a different way. The biggest, the biggest influence of parents, and for I don't know whether it's um, representative or not, but the biggest influence of parents when I go around the room in my organization, where a human is dads. Oh, I see. Dad said, do not, now for some of them, it would be computing wasn't really a thing at the time. And it was like, this computer thing sounds great. You should get going on that. <laughs> so, and then obviously later on, they, they realized technology is a thing. And I know Accenture's done some research in this space around the importance of parents. So I know your question to me was about schools, but I think this is a schools and a parent conversation. And how do we educate parents that they can help structure some of these conversations about options very early on. Also working in tandem with schools who have a wealth of information there, but they have to navigate all this in order to to find and present and distill down, you know, know, different options that students have. So I think it's both, but I think you cannot overlook the importance of of a parent or someone significant in in you know a young person's life that says actually you know you should think about this you you seem to have a real skill in that space yeah and even if they don't work in the tech sector themselves but they've heard something good about it and they've they've mentioned that as a career choice because there there is that problem um you know with we do have a PR issue sometimes with the tech industry and people hear negative things and um you know if you haven't got parents uh, promoting that to their children. Um, as a good career, then you're absolutely right. It, you know, they they pick up things from 
from uh, their parents or what they see on on TV or just somebody that that can step in and suggest that as as a really good career option. Um, One of the things that we do at WITS, Kaylee, is like we we have a very strong um, student membership because it's free. Uh, and we and we try and bring our students with us once they leave. Um, obviously, the the student base that they, and they've gone into work. We we like to keep to keep our membership. And one of the things that we've done very successfully in the last few years, and it's actually been run by um, one of the product directors here at Work Human, who's on the board at, at Wits, uh, Martina Campbell. She really wanted to open up. We do a lot of kind of show and tell days, like here's all the things that you can do in this industry. So we do engineering, we do pharma, we do technology. And on the technology one, a couple of years ago, she actually introduced the, the role of product manager. Now for those technologists out there, they'd be like, that's not a tech. <laughs> but all of a sudden then, we, it was actually the most well-attended session that we had that year around this, because this was... How do I get into that? I didn't know you counted this as tech. This is something I want to do. I love that idea of design thinking. I think I'd be really good at this. I'm really great with people. And all of a sudden we were away to the races. So that this year we're trying to do a very different role. So we did a whole UX series last year as well. So we're coming away from the most more traditional software engineer, software QA, scrum master roles into these more um well they're, they're really quite sexy some of them aren't they like product owner ux type roles because that's the whole suite of these are the the kind of creative thinking and the different people that you need in technology and i think if you if you have parents or people that you really rely on and they're not in that industry they don't know that you, you, you don't know what you don't know and so how can we sort of get this kind of this isn't about coding there is so much more in there to it. If you want to code, brilliant. But there's so many other different layers to that, uh, that that we need in order to have great products and really great solutions to some of these big world problems. Yeah, yeah we hear that so often. We, we've had um, quite a few project managers uh, on, on here and, and some of our videos um, for She Can Code as well. And you're absolutely right. It's that, it's that sweet spot of... You don't have to be technical, but you have to at least understand how the product works, but you don't have to build the product. Mm. Um, and it's it's that that nice place that a lot of people just didn't realize um, existed. And, you know, I, I was going to ask you next about what support employers can give to graduates as they step into their first jobs. But, you know, you mentioned there a little bit just about even just showing graduates the type of roles that are available, um, because it, that is far more valuable than say a work experience day you know we've all been on a work experience day where you get left at the shredder or the photocopier and that's your day and you don't actually learn you know what's going to what the company does or what everybody does uh, what their jobs are um so actually just you know taking the time to share what all those different roles are and for them to make the connection and start thinking actually that one might be the one for me is far more valuable for for an employer to start with surely and also the journey of how you got there because uh, again I'm going to I'm going to pick on my automation QA colleagues and they're like yeah that's twice she's done that what's gone on here <laughs> but, I mean I mean they weren't in college thinking oh, this is it this is what I'm going to do do you know they've gone through the course and thought I'm actually really good at this and it's not it doesn't kill me it seems to be killing everyone else in the room why isn't it killing me and they and they'll start to pick at that I, I think you know we have some phenomenal product managers here that came from an engineering background we also have some um really brilliant engineering managers. They would have been sort of scrum masters in a previous title. And again, they've come from very different backgrounds. Some of them are from pure product management. Others have come th through that sort of the, that engineering space as well. But they have that thing that you have, that you've just said there, which I think is really important. They can translate. They can yeah. translate from those business teams into the technology teams and, and translate that backwards. So they're really good about listening and, and, and turning this round into something else. And that's a real skill. And all those sort of transversal skills, those value add skills, we should be talking about them as well as, as you know, our students are leaving, leaving college. 
It's not about getting 90% in the module and you're going to be great at doing that. You need great communication. Unless you're going to sit in a room on your own and just code all day. And that's okay. But at some stage, you have to give it over to someone, you know. So you <laughs> And explain how it works. Yeah. Really good <laughs> comm skills and be, be way more comfortable in doing that. And one of the things I know when we do team turn here is that they're on site for two weeks. The first week they go home. I always send them home early on a Friday. I never put anything in on the Friday. They're exhausted. Yep. Exhausted. The fast pace of work. I mean, it, I, I don't think you realise, because you're in it every day, you're going from room to room. I could be whiteboarding, looking, you know, drawing on the walls, which always, even I'm 55 this year, it still feels naughty. Do you know what I mean? You're drawing on the walls and it's, you know, you're looking at this sort of database design and then I could walk out of the room and I could go into do something around design theory. We're looking at something new within the product. What does that look like? Then I could go into a people leader conversation. So you're, you're context switching all the time as you're moving from room to room. I don't mind moving around this building because it very much gives me the time to think, OK, I need to think about that later. I'm walking into this now. This is what I want to do. That blows their mind that first week that they're going from one thing to another. And it's so fast moving. And, and it's great fun in terms of the lunch and the breakfast and they can play pool. But they're exhausted, exhausted. And I think to showcase the world of work today, where you're seeing in an organization like Work Human, which is very human centered and people centered, but like it's it's tough. It's just like we have a full day and there are things that we're trying to solve and you're on it all the time. And I think that's a really important thing to show and showcase as well, because it becomes less jarring then as you're stepping out of education yeah and when you have place. that first day and you're like oh my, god, oh my word I was so tired today and you know, <laughs> set up and, and nothing stopped and you, you're absolutely right because when you join you're not you're not thinking of those things as well you're not thinking of um how busy your day is going to be or that you're allowed as well um to take hold of that role and to prioritize your tasks and that you don't have to do everything at once and all of those things you haven't learned those skills yet you know it's quite overwhelming when you get in and you think I've got to do all these things and I don't know that I'm allowed to you know just um organize my own day um but also you know it just just having the space I suppose just realizing you don't think when you graduate I need to look for a company that is going to not look after me but at least keep an eye on my mental health and whether or not I'm burning out and you don't think of those things as a graduate you just think I need to get into a good role and that's it and you're absolutely right if you see what somebody else's day is like but you also pick up on the fact that that company is very aware of what what that person is doing and they're trying to make sure that even though you know you might have a very busy day at work human your company would still look out for you to make sure that you don't burn out um and uh, as you said there's that support network as well but there are things you don't think of as a young person but I think that's becoming more important Kaylee so we, we did some work human did some really great research last year and it was one in four women didn't matter what stage in the career so you're talking entry level through to VP had said they would consider leaving their organization if the a diversity inclusion and equity a strategy didn't make a noticeable improvement in the first part of 2023. And I think this is in direct response to coming back to work, returning yeah. to the office, trying to get that balance, really trying to keep hold of those heartful wins that we've had in terms of that flexibility, which is we know is especially important to women, uh, women who have children, women who are in full time caring occupations. So that is really stark that one and four women are thinking, I need to see improvements here, otherwise I'm going to think about going. Yes. Uh, and I think that's across all ages now. So I think it's becoming increasingly important that values are starting to line up. These are my values. And are they lining up to this organization that I'm going to work for? And it's funny because uh, I can't remember where I'd seen the research but I know even graduates now are looking at 
company core values and seeing so let's say they're big on sustainability if they don't have a sustainability value within there they're quite that's a question that they'll have the interview so I think it's you're starting to see that come through which I think is great because again it goes back to the point we said before about that feeling really authentic in that connection not only to the people that you're working with but to fundamentally the company that you're working for Yes. You know, if, if you don't feel that and you're at odds, that's always going to be in- incredibly difficult, and very, very jarring as you step into your career. Yeah. And, and that leads um, nicely into the topic of mentorship, because actually, when, when you um, mentioned before about networking and you turn up with your business card and that is what I thought networking was as a young person and didn't realize that networking is not just to get your next job or, you know, that 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 uh, it's not what what you know, it's who you know. That's what I used to think as a young person. I must, you know, make sure I know a lot of people that are going to help me get my next job. You're absolutely bang on there that it's far more than that. It's far, it's, it's more about finding that support network to help you with anything in your career and just to make you feel like sometimes that you're not the only one that's feeling a, a particular way. Um, so, you know, mentorship in that way can, can be invaluable. So, you know, do you think mentorship and female role models being more visible could help plug that gap? I think we need to be more visible. And I know we've really come on in the last, you know, three to five years, you're seeing way more of this. But I I think we have to be more unapologetically intentional, Kaylee, in this space. And where you are setting up opportunities, if you think about when you were really young and you were like me, you had to go into a room with the business card and you'd be filled with dread. Imagine if you would have been given an opportunity to join a coffee connect where it's it's women the same age roughly same industry and you're going in for a coffee and a biscuit you would have absolutely have drawn mass do you know to me like and obviously it was in the days before zoom I know that your younger listeners listen to this like where the days before zoom the where I love and you get in there and you'd you'd have a coffee and, and you'd have a chat I would have done that over going to a conference and having to speak to all these strange people I think there's different ways we can do it for different levels of comfort and for different personality types. Um, I I have really close friends who are very introverted. I know you find that hard to believe, but they are, you know, and they'd say to me, oh, I couldn't do that what you do. But like they're phenomenal, phenomenal allies, these women, like they're worth the weight in absolute gold. So I think there's that easier mentorship opportunity that you should absolutely go and do and really challenge yourself to do it and I know it's difficult but then as you move through your career I think there's a change I wish someone would have sat me down and told me that there's a there's a difference between mentorship and then as you're going through your career what actually you may start to look for is sponsorship and uh, it was actually Dr Anita Sands we had her in to work human she did a phenomenal talk and she's really articulate in this space about what the differences are I'm not as articulate but that difference between mentorship and sponsorship and being really tuned into what that means mentorship is obviously someone you know shoulder to shoulder helping you through something where sponsorship you don't have to be in the room but they're going to say really good things about you and I think that's really really important Um, For me, again, that would I wish someone would have maybe sat me down earlier to say, actually, the thing you're looking for there is sponsorship. You need sponsorship when you're not in that room and decisions are being made about you and about your career and everything else that you've got these really strong allies in the room speaking up for you. And again, I think it's being a little bit more intentional about that. Yes, you're you're right. That's something um, that I only found about. uh, about sponsorship um probably only a few years ago and didn't, in, and you're right everybody talks about mentorship and making those connections and and uh, making time to have that coffee with somebody that would be a great ally um but you know if you're if you're in a company uh and you're um one of five females in a huge company and you have lots of male sponsors that are above you that are talking about you um as you said in the right rooms in the right way um then that's that's absolutely you know just so valuable for for your career um and something that you're right I think a lot of young people didn't realize can exist 
um, and can, can really help your career. Um, in terms of those skills, you know, what skills should graduates be honing before they start on their career journey? Many, you know, the young ones in STEM now, they're, they're really tuned into that continuous professional development. They know they're not in and done. Like they're going to have to, especially within pharma and tech, they're constantly updating their skills. And I think that's absolutely it. And you want to stay curious and you want people to keep it up. All the things we've been talking about today, I'd love you to look at that through the lens of that CPD. I'd love you to think, you know, I'm going to read that book on audio or I'm going to listen to that podcast. It's nothing to do with technical. It's nothing to do with science. Not, but actually, it's about me. It's about allyship. It's about how you make authentic connection. It's about, oh, someone told me that she was really good on that podcast. I must listen. I think we need to encourage people to do that because if you if you put that energy into it around thinking well something will something will strike something will hit home and land and you'll think oh my goodness I could do that and that won't kill me (laughs) I could do that and that could actually make a difference and I think you need to try on different things but it's not one shot and you're done either Kaylee I think that's why and as you move through your career you need different things at different times I have a wonderful executive coach called Morris Whelan. He's actually a super, super friend. And I remember him saying to me years ago, tell me about your personal board. And I said, me what? (laughs) He was like, tell me about your personal board. You've been telling me all about these amazing people that you have around you who do all these different things. To me, they're your personal board. Tell me what you get from them and what they have in common. And as I walk through that journey with them, it was a real eye opener because all the things that I've spoken to you about today, mentorship, allyship, sponsorship, making meaningful connection, that's all those people on that board. That's what they're responsible for. And they they nourish you, they support you and you get phenomenal energy from them. And they really are when we meet in larger groups they could rule the world. I often think about that when we're all together. I think actually if I could leave them to rule the world, we'd be in a way, way better place. But that idea of personal board is is a really, it really resonated with me because these are a close circle and usually you're relying on them for certain things. And so it's about putting a little bit more energy in that, but actually really thinking about it. Yeah, this is, I know I go to X when I want to know a little bit more about this. I know when I'm talking about maybe trying to shake things up within that sort of women and science piece that I actually have two or three go-tos that I'll bang these ideas up because they're always really super up to date and they've got the same types of energy that I have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important as well. Take these people with you on your journey. Yeah. The effort into keep those relationships going because they serve you well. And they make you so much better. It's very difficult to do this on your own. Very, very difficult. And if you have these support systems other than family and colleagues, you have that concept of your personal board. I think it just makes life so much easier, Kaylee, to go and execute on some of these things. Yeah, I I mean, I was going to ask you about advice for those starting out um, in your career, but actually that that's that's um really good advice to think about your personal board I don't think it's something that a lot of us do I think we just move through you know our careers and and as you you mentioned there when I said that to you who who came to mind straight away for you someone would have come into your head straight away as I said it uh, <laughs> I have a colleague on my team who yeah, you, so you don't have that. to say who it is but as soon as I say it usually people will think wow of, of it's that actually yes. the, the extension of that is are the people on your personal board who aren't serving you well and sometimes people look at me and then they might start to cry and I'll be like but again I think it's a really great conversation to have with yourself around these are the people who nourish me encourage me and give me strength to go and do these things um you know over and above my day-to-day um, yes. And then when when the data gate gets tough, you have these people that maybe aren't your colleagues and aren't your significant other that you can actually you know pick up the phone and say, well, <laughs> need need a little bit of help. 
I'm looking this. Um, I, oh, don't worry. Yeah. I, oh, yeah, no, that's awful. That's awful. But here's what you can do. And I think that is really, really important. But it has to be authentic. Yes. And, and that they come from, as you mentioned, all, all parts of your life. It's not necessarily um that colleague uh the wonderful colleague of mine that sprung to mind um but <laughs> it's those that are um in your personal life and and you know even those that you um your neighbors or who, whoever it may be you're absolutely right it's um it as you mentioned that um expression at the start uh, which is something we love that that tribe that you bring together um that that really supports you through um in terms of the uh plugging the gap should we should we plug that at the source we've spoke a little bit about um you know should we be encouraging more girls into stem subjects you know early on is that is that early enough to get started or you know by the time they reach uni is that is that too late I think it's too late I mean I think this is a multifaceted problem and we need to go back as early as we possibly can um, and showcase, you know, really strong role models. Uh, Wits has just done a, a brilliant uh, sort of peace stem role model project where we're um, showcasing sort of um, physics and all that peace stem. Really strong role models here in Ireland, and I think that's really really important. C and B. But for me, one of the things that I've really agitated for in the past couple of years at a European level is. There's some brilliant things going on, Kayleigh. You have them on your program, so you know. There's some, and I call these pockets of pure fabulousness, really great programs. Bit of joined up thinking and we could get a lot of traction, a lot of traction. And I think if we could do joined up thinking at a national and European level, all of a sudden then these aren't pockets of fabulousness in a corner. These start to become mainstream. And I know like funding is incredibly tight for everyone at the moment, but if we could join the dots across some of this stuff, it would make such a difference, like such a difference. So I think it's a multifaceted, big, hairy problem. <laughs> um, and we should absolutely, the further we can go back in terms of showcasing and role modeling very, very early on, trying to turn young women's heads towards STEM and really break down that those barriers in terms of what that actually means I think it's great but if we could actually join up some of the really great programs out there I think we could actually get way more traction so much quicker and that's one of the things that we try to do uh, from a work human perspective and a wits perspective is bring people together and really try and tie the bow around it and see if we can get something going. Yeah, and we spoke a little bit earlier about parents and and the the way, especially that a dad can have um, uh, in swaying um, young girls into careers. But do you think that girls are choosing not to pursue a career in STEM, or are they being excluded from the system? I I think it's a little bit of both. I think I mean there are certain schools where you wouldn't maybe have physics options, which is like. Here in Ireland, there are schools where young women can't take physics at a higher level. It's just not offered in school. So if they want that, they're going to have to move schools. Now, you know yourself, then it's like, well, I'm going to transplant myself from my friends and, you know, uh, the football club and everything else so I can go and do physics. Yeah, it's quite nice. You really need to want to do physics to do that. Um, so I think that there are barriers like that. I also think then there's a lot of that peer pressure where, you know, you're going to go into arts or humanities and you're going to be creative. We need creativity within STEM. It's the fundamental of what we do. But I think we really need to bring that alive to people around what that looks like. Um, and, you know, really ignite the imagination around that. And if you can do that earlier, the better. It's very difficult to be doing that. Uh, you know, when, as you're taking your options into O levels, A levels, or leaving cert here in Ireland, it's very difficult. You you want to have got to them before that. Yeah, because even you earlier mentioning about um, UX roles and product managers, very creative roles, and something that you wouldn't necessarily think of as creative um, in technology. But again, it's one of those roles that um, people people don't know about and they don't see enough. Um, but 
you know, so we 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 always think here, you know, you can't be what you can't see. And it's having those role models that are doing those jobs and that are there, they're either going into schools or you might see them on TV or you might see them on a program and they might be a speaker at a careers fair that you're at as a student. Um, Do you have any role models? You mentioned Michelle Obama earlier. Um, (laughs) Do you you have any brilliant role models that, that, um, that, you know, we should be aware of? Um, my own personal role models would actually be maybe members of my personal board. I mean, they'd, they'd be really close friends who are just phenomenal. Do you know what I mean? Who would, uh, they, they just, I don't know where they get their energy and commitment from. I, I, I t- I'm going to give you an example of a role model that blew me away uh, at the at the start of COVID. Wits had, uh, we put on a with Work Human a um, senior leadership female program. So we had different senior female leaders coming in to talk right the way across the STEM disciplines. And I said, we need to kick it off. So we'll kick it off with someone. And someone said to me, actually, she's a WITS member and she's absolutely super. She's our citizen astronaut here in Ireland, Nora Patton. So I said, great. So we got on with Nora. I said, Nora, we kick this off for me, love. She said, absolutely be delighted to. And she'd done cartoons and she's really the kids love that. I said, great. So start of COVID and the kids were out. So she did the kickoff. And I hadn't thought about, I thought we were going to get questions at the end. But obviously all the kids were off school and we went, ran way over. And the feedback from that where she had talked, she'd done a talk through and started talking about it phenomenal like blew the thing up all together because she captured their imagination and you know the emails that we got I'm going to going to go on now and do something about space I'm going to be like Nora I'm asking Father Christmas for an astronaut suit for Christmas (laughs) and you know when you talk about role models sometimes they come in very different shapes and sizes than the things that you're thinking about a Michelle Obama or these really strong you know women This woman is changing the face of how young women in Ireland view science. And it was phenomenal to see. Uh, And it wasn't our intention. Like she'd come to kick off this very, you know, hefty, serious female leadership uh, program, but just blew the thing away. Absolutely. And I think, you know, when you when you look at someone like Nora, who's young, she's just started the family, uh, hoping to do some more work with her. She's phenomenal. That's what you want. You need that energy and that just some, someone that can fire the imagination. Uh, and I know that day she would have changed. It might only be four or five, but she's changed the way those children think about science. Yes. And it's like phenomenal. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's the type of person that you're looking for when you look at those role models. Yeah. And even if they don't go into that particular role she sent them off on a path of discovery of the roles that are available in that area um yeah it's I think the the more that we hear about people's roles and what they do and how exciting they can be um the better for for the young girls um uh um, coming up the pipeline when we when we talk about uh those um that networking Work Human IQ, which is basically the academy which underpins, has 20 years of our data, did something phenomenal for me. And actually, I can can show you this. Um, But when you think about what we do is reward and recognition and that meaningful connection, I'm celebrating you, you're, you're celebrating me. When you actually visualize that and you look at a, a female network, compared to a male's network there's a huge difference in gender so females have significantly larger networks they have a more gender balanced network uh, the networks are way more cross-functional cross department going up and down the hierarchy across the piece and I'm going to show you I don't know if you can see it on the, that's a visualization of a female's network Oh, yes, I can say. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. And have you seen a, a male? It's, it's in depth. smaller <laughs> and not as spidery. It's phenomenal to see. And all those points are obviously people and all those pieces are those connections. And that's what the work human IQ data uh, obviously brings to the service. If you think about that, the more spidery your network, the better. 
Yeah. But we seem to be able to do this innately. And I think, you know, when we go back to that messaging about mentorship, that's what you want to be doing. You want to be ending up with a, a, a network that looks very spidery and look like someone's run all over the page. And it does stand to you as you move on. Yeah. Lovely. And that is lovely advice to end on because we're already out of time. So thank you so much, Andrea, for joining us. It's been it's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you today. Lovely. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And for everybody listening, as always, thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you again next time.